welcome back you guys to episode four, another mini lesson. In this episode, we're going to take a look at another um, jazz chart that I wrote where I used a bunch of ideas that I stole from some classical compositions that I was studying. So when composing jazz types of things, there's some different ways of working. One is to just write a lead sheet where you have a melody and chord changes. But another way is to write out really specific parts and voicings and counter lines and things like that. And both ways are really enjoyable for composing. Um, a real genius composer like Thelonious Monk can pack as much beauty and musical meaning into one sheet of paper as a great orchestral composer can do in hundreds of pages of score. So often when I'm composing jazz things, I want to do something a little beyond the lead sheet because I want to have a little more control of what is happening in the music so I can set up different types of things. So that said, I'd like to look at a chart from my album called Headspace, and there's a tune called Driving Home Music. I wanted to put this tune at the very end of the album, and I wanted to have the tune end and the whole album end with this textural sort of idea that I heard in Maurice Ravel, one of my favorite composers. I made a video a while back of the first movement of his poems of Mallarmé, so I'll link to that below. In that video, I showed how the opening utilized this beautiful textural idea in the ensemble. There's this E minor pentatonic wash with lots of harmonics in the strings and cluster chords using the pentatonic scale in the piano. The singer sometimes leaves E minor pentatonic and sings F sharp and C sharp, giving a beautiful E Dorian feel. So you can watch that later if you want to see that. So I wanted to steal this and have my album end with this sort of pentatonic wash. But how was I going to do that? At the time, I was digging into Messiaen's masterpiece, Quartet for the End of Time. And I wanted to use some of the ideas that I was studying in there. So I mentioned in an earlier video how much I like a book about Bartok's mathematical ideas and his composing. And these are all things Bartok didn't tell anybody about. They figured it out after he died, as I understand it. Messian, on the other hand, he did just the opposite. So he wrote a whole book about his compositional techniques. And he described exactly what he was doing. You can read it for free online by doing a quick search on Messian, Techniques of My Musical Language. So I was also digging into another book written specifically about this quartet. And I marked up my score with all the things I was learning. So one thing Messian did was to use different types of pedals as he describes them. So rhythmic pedals are a repeating set of rhythms, like an ostinato of rhythms that keep repeating. Harmonic pedals are a repeating set of harmony that keep repeating. A melodic pedal is a repeating melody, like an ostinato. So you have these three types of pedals, rhythmic and harmonic and melodic. So here's a look at my marked up score of the first movement. So this is a very quick overview of this piece and just a little taste of it. This subject is a huge dissertation all into itself. I'm just giving you a little taste. You can dig into it on your own if you want to get further into this. Okay, so the violin and the clarinet are playing bird songs, the nightingale and the blackbird, respectively, which Messiaen transcribed in the woods. The cello, however, is playing a melodic line that consists of only five repeated pitches from the same whole tone scale. So basically the C whole tone scale without the note A flat. Those five pitches are used to create this 15 note melody that repeats seven and a half times within three, four meter using a repeated rhythmic pattern. So this rhythmic pedal is 33 eighth notes long and really has no regard for three, four whatsoever. The 15 note rhythmic pattern breaks down into two sections that contain non-retrogradable rhythms. So that means that the rhythm is the same whether it's played forwards or backwards. Therefore, it can't be retrograded or played backwards because if you clapped out this rhythm forwards or backwards, it would be exactly the same rhythm. So the cello is playing this melody seven and a half times. So that in itself might give you some ideas of some different ways of putting music together. Meanwhile, the piano has its own tricks. So the pianist is playing a repeated sequence of 29 chords over and over. Meanwhile, these 29 chords are being played in a rhythmic pattern that consists of 17 rhythmic events. So in these measures, there's a rhythmic ostinato and a harmonic ostinato happening at the same time. 
because 29 chords are happening over the 17 rhythms, they will not line up for a long, long time. So Messian used prime numbers to prevent things from lining up. So if you've never heard this piece, go and check it out. You can't actually hear all this stuff happening. It sort of sounds like you're out in the woods, walking along and listening to birds, and things are just kind of floating by naturally. It's really quite an amazing experience. Okay, so now back to my tune. Now I know that Messian liked to use prime numbers for his groupings and repetitions. For example, using two against four isn't going to do much because it's going to line up again so quickly. Seven against eleven, not so much. So firstly, the pianist, me in this case, plays five note groupings, five eighth notes, using the D pentatonic scale. And that will repeat every five measures. It'll end up back on one again. So that's simple enough. But the left hand of the piano plays a sequence of four chords, which of course repeat every four measures. So you can see the tension it creates, with the right hand repeating every five measures and the left hand repeating every four measures. It would take five times four, or twenty measures, for both hands to line up again. It's a simple idea, but it made for an interesting sound. It creates its own sort of rhythmic dissonance or tension. Now let's take a look at the guitar part. I have him playing pentatonic eighth notes in groups of seven, another prime number. So every seven bars, he'll be back at the start of the pattern. And that's happening against the five eighth notes of the piano's right hand and the four bars of the piano's left hand. So it will take a long while for these things to line back up. But there's one more step. After the bass player has played whole notes for 16 bars, I give him his own figure, which is the pattern in 11-4. So these four things are all happening at once. The piano plays four bar phrases in the left hand while the other parts are in 5-8 and 7-8 and 11-4. So you get the idea. Now for the final touch. I had my two lead soloists, Joel Fromm on tenor saxophone and John Swana on EV, playing freely over the piano's left hand changes. And being the awesome soloists that they are, they improvised all kinds of beautiful stuff and added to the wash, just the right kind of things to fill out the texture. So hopefully that gives you some composing ideas. These overlapping ostinatos and different meters, creating washy textures and colors. There's a lot to explore in these things. Okay, let's put away all the notes and the numbers and the math and just listen to this section of the chart now. So here it is. So that was a lot of information about what in the end was a pretty simple idea and a way to get the effect I was after, not nearly as complex as the scores I studied, but I found my own way of using them for what I wanted. All of those composers and scores and books were rolling around in my mind as I was putting that chart together, and this is how it all showed up. Hoping that maybe that gave you some ideas you can check out for your own composing, some things that you can find your own way to use. All right, stay safe, keep on listening and stealing, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.